Today, I wanted to do something a little different and talk about the planet of Necromunda, the setting for the incredibly fun miniatures game. And I want to dive in here because it's a great entry point for understanding the bleak darkness of the far future in Warhammer 40k. I did start a series talking about like kind of a general setting thing, but I want to really dive in to really a great entry point before you load on all stuff about Horus Heresy and Primarchs, all kind of stuff. Let's talk about the everyday people of the Imperium and while I'm very excited to talk about the various gangs and factions of Necromunda, I wanted to kind of set the scene before beginning. Necromunda is a planet that is relatively close to the Soul system. It is you know, our system. It is a hive world, making it a very special, though depressingly not unique kind of planet. Hive worlds are what you get from overpopulation, overmining, and an inhospitable environment. So much of the planet has been mined for resources, mountains are turned into rubble, oceans are little more than toxic bogs. The planet itself is basically a dead husk. To survive, societies built these what they call hive cities, these mega structures that pierce the skies. Where cities are built upon one another, building upwards instead of outwards into the hellscape. Of course, as you would imagine, all the rich live at the top of the hive, at the upper levels towards the sky. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but there are several such hives on the planet of Necromunda. And it may be easy to ask, what does this planet offer the Imperium? And the answer is twofold. Bodies, like raw manpower, and manufacturing. The planet boasts an insane number of residents, and this makes it an excellent recruiting pool for the Astra Militarum. Even the Imperial Fist Space Marine chapter are known to enroll the toughest of the gangers into their ranks, and more importantly, it's a lot of bodies to work the millions of factories on the planet, creating common household items to weapons of war, like last guns and bolters and things like that. It's a planet of bleak industry, right? You are born to work, and work you will, until you die, at which point your body is taken by the corpse grinders, turned into corpse starch, which is like a generic protein, fed to the next generation to do it all over again. There is no upward mobility, no improving your lot in life. You live and die in the hive for the hive. And while this may seem so like oppressively bleak that it can repel folks, it makes the backdrop for some really fun and interesting drama. The intrigue and backstabbing of the noble cast, the peasants all fighting and squabbling for power and control, and then the masses, everything below them even, just trying to eke out a good and happy life. To understand the interesting ecosystem that this planet creates, let's really dive into the structure and nature of a hive city. And we'll use one as an example, but it is indicative of them all with, of course, some variation. Some hives focus on one thing versus another in terms of what they manufacture, and their culture can be a little bit different. But really, we're going to cover like what, what an essentially a generic hive city would be. If you were to approach a hive city flying towards it, it would almost look like a giant termite hive, right? If you've ever seen one of those things, I'll throw a picture up here for you, where it's this odd yet natural structure. It's full of spires and spikes and it's tallest at the center, but then forming pointy mountain ranges as it spreads outward. This is in fact a mind-bendingly big man-made structure. The shell on the outside, which gives it the kind of nasty look, is actually from grime. Minerals and refuse of the planet and the city itself getting caked on the sides. But underneath that is a mega city. And under that mega city is the city it was built over. And so on and so on. It kind of just keeps going downward. Societies that build upward in this harsh and unforgiving environment, right? Constant work is done to make sure the hive city's defenses are functional and not mired in that grime in case of an assault. So that is the outer appearance, right? Very deceptive, big beyond belief, but let's talk about the interior, right? That's where all the action is. And in the center of every hive city is what's called a heat sink. It's a long vertical shaft that pierces through the entire hive. This is a tunnel that goes straight from the core of the planet up to all points of the hive city itself. It is the singular source of power for the entire thing. Solar power doesn't work. They used up all the other natural resources. Again, like the environment's so harsh that sunlight doesn't really get through in a meaningful way. Only the heat of the planet core keeps the factories and homes lit up. At all levels of the hive, you can find these power plants, right? Converting the raw heat of the core of the planet into usable energy. 
These plans are oftentimes how uh, gangs and businesses and political leaders can exert their control over a given population. And so at this point, I'm going to start talking about the various sections of a hive city. Because these things are so vast, there's like a natural social hierarchy and culture to each layer of it. Put simply, the rich and the powerful live at the top, the poor and the destitute are at the bottom, with things hitting a gray area in the middle. And while the book describes these areas as like clear and distinct zones, they do kind of blend into one another. It's not like level 13 is for rich people and level 12 is for the poor folks. Nothing like that. These, these areas kind of blend into one another, kind of more like a climate zones here on Earth. So I'm going to describe the different types of environments in a hive, but understand that while I do, they follow the basic idea, right? Of good at on the top, like, you know, things are great on top and things are bad on the bottom. Because there's so much room in each hive, you can design kind of a scene, a slice of it to represent whatever you want. So first up are the hab zones. I'm assuming short for habitat. This is a catch-all term for more residential areas. And hab zones exist at all levels of a hive city. This is really where that wealth disparity is on display because the rich have hab zones towards the top of the hive or its spires, often have access to real sunlight, possibly even exotic off-world food imported from nearby like agro worlds where they do a lot of farming and food production. It's largely populated by the elite household of any hive. In sharp contrast is the hab zones for pretty much anyone else, right? Often called the twilight levels due to the lack of sun, everything is lit artificially with a harsh, efficient luminescence. These areas can vary in their relative safety and space, but this is the overwhelming majority of living conditions in the hive. People here spend their days shuffling to the manufacturums, coming home to see if they can eke out an existence. And this seems to be a good time to point out the average diet of a hiver, as I mentioned before, involves a lot of a product called corpse starch. It's the most basic protein material there is available to the masses, which is why I point out, you know, I pointed out the rich being able to eat food from off world. Corpse starch is recycled biomatter from the dead. The corpse grinders collect the dead, their remains are broken down into corpse starch, and that goes back into feeding the masses. There's no way to import enough food for everyone in the hive to actually eat a healthy diet. And the environment is too harsh to allow for agriculture. And I tacked this point on here because I thought it kind of fit well enough into the understanding of the living conditions when we talk about the hab zones. Now the next section we're gonna cover is what's called the manufactory zones. Now the reason the hive world exists and are still supported by the Imperium is the sheer resource of manufacturing power and human resource available. Oftentimes a hab zone will be set up right next to a manufactory zone and uh, those residents will go you know, from that hab zone specifically to those manufacturing plants. These locations are often dark, busy, and dangerous. Thousands of pipes and electrical lines weaving in all directions, carrying the filth and refuse of industrial production across the hive, hopefully leading outside to drain out, but sometimes pipes burst, wires get crossed, and there's all kinds of accidents. Now all of this makes sense, right? You have zones for housing and zones for business and industry, but the reason to highlight this space is twofold. One, the bleak nature of factory life, which is like the thankless and depressing setting, but also to showcase how the gangs of Necromunda interact. Oftentimes a gang will control a given region of the hive, right? A slice of the pie, if you will. And they may control a, a hab zone and a manufactory zone of this slice, but another gang controls their power supply coming from the heat sink. So this economy naturally develops, right, where gang one gives manufactured goods that were made in that manufactory zone uh, and raw materials to gang two in exchange for power. Electrical power, I mean. When this is magnified by hundreds of zones and regions and gang, tori, gang territories that can exist in a single hive, you end up with this very aggressive but self-regulating economy. Now, all of these exchanges go on under the watchful eye of the Necromunda nobility, and as long as the quotas are met and the deadlines of production are honored, nobody actually cares. And this is oftentimes some of the, the setup for Necromunda missions if you're playing the miniatures game, right? These disparate factions vying for control of precious resources, power, authority, locations, things like that. Now, one thing that's important to remember is that a hive city is built upon the remains of other cities. I've mentioned that a few times now, building upward. So there are sections that are just called ruined manufactories, whether through a structural collapse, accident, equipment failure, 
you know, some of these areas are just lost. Gangs in these areas are quick to scavenge for resources, usable technology, and equipment to be refurbished and resold. And I do want to point out that the, the have zones and manufacturing areas really make up the vast bulk of a hive city, right? Like these areas kind of intermingling with one another, you know, creating their little natural like slices as I call it, really make up the bulk of what we would consider to be a, a hive in totality. But there are areas even further below that. There is a section called the under hive. Even further down, this is far below all the manufacturing and hab zones. It's essentially the ruins of long forgotten cities and structures, some dating back to when the planet had a functional ecology. It's somehow even more bleak and dangerous than the other sections, and it's the setting for a lot of the Necromunda games. So if you have played um, Underhive, which is the initial set when they relaunched Necromunda the game, this is kind of where those things are happening. The reason being, if gangs want to have open war, right, they often fight down here. This is kind of like the proving ground, where the prying eye of the aristocracy is nowhere to be found. Because it wouldn't do to have open war. I mean, you could have like, you know, assets go and try to you know, claim some territories and things like that, small skirmishes. But if you just want to brawl, it doesn't do to have them kind of fight around such valuable assets like factories and power plants, things like that. This is the most lawless space of any given hive. Oftentimes, powerful gang families will send their young down here to fight, to survive, and hopefully teach them valuable lessons. Weeding out the weak, so that the gang's powerful lineage can continue. And really quickly tacking on one final note, there is one more level that's kind of described, although there's not a lot of information given to it, and that is the hive bottom. And really briefly, this is the absolute lowest level of the hive. It's crumbling buildings, toxic air and water. Nothing can survive here long, like naturally without a suit or something like that, except for these horrific mutants. And it's a wretched place, the dumping ground of millennia, of trash and, and industrial pollutants and rubble. But there are a few story elements that do take place as things are pulled or, or reclaimed from the hive bottom. Now to put this in all in perspective, millions upon millions live in a single hive. And Necromunda is populated by thousands of hives. Some boast millions and billions as I said before. Some are completely empty, home to only the dead. And this is just one of thousands of hive planets. So you can see the vast scale and scope of the Imperium. But let's take a step back, as I always do in these videos, and talk about why is this cool? Why is Necromunda a cool setting for a miniatures game? First of all, the size and scale, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is you can design whatever piece of the hive you want to have. And the fact that all these areas, they really do kind of blend together and there are lower spires than just the one at the very top, meaning there are semi-rich people as you kind of work your way upward further and further. And so you have these meeting grounds where there are some rich next to some poor and that kind of stuff. And you can play around with that disparity to create whatever story arc you want. And honestly, that's my favorite thing about some of these miniature games is it's the backdrop for great stories, right? Different levels of intrigue between um, the rich and the gangs, right? It's big enough for an environment, so whatever you want to tell. And it has its own ecosystem of power and control. So for example, you know, at the top level, you have all the rich people playing a game against each other for like their noble, you know, royal intrigue kind of stuff. And of course, below that, you have the gangs all fighting and you know, pushing for scraps and things like that. But then you can add levels of complexity where certain noble houses will back certain gangs to achieve a certain result. And so now that those two separate dramas are now cross-pollinating and this can happen to make all kinds of really interesting narratives. And even though it's bleak, the human experience of, of a fighting for a better life does not go away, right? It, it is meant to be bleak, but the fact that it is like billions of people on these planets go to work every day because they think that it can, you know, if nothing else, their lives can have meaning. And I think that's a really important thing to remember where Games Workshop makes these settings so crazy dark just all the time. But honestly, you know, there's, it's meant to be, first of all, a little tongue in cheek, but in addition to that also just, there's normal people trying to live their lives. And, and all the stuff that we play with Necromunda with like the gangs and that kind of stuff, uh, it's all this weird subplot. And I think that's a really cool thing. All of this is like on the down low sort of, and I absolutely find that hysterical. 
So friends, tell me in the comments below, do you play Necromunda? I uh, just picked it up this last year and I have been playing quite a bit of Escher lately, although I did grab a few boxes for Goliaths and Cawdor, I believe. And I'm interested to see those. If you haven't been following along, I've been doing quite a few paint painting hangouts where I really went through the Dark Uprising terrain set and had a blast with that. So let me know in the comments below what you play and how you like to play Necromunda. And I will see you next time. Happy Wargaming.